I just left? Everything's going already? Testing one, two, three. Okay, we're all set. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and begin, but before we do, I would like to close out the Sabbath. Uh, for those uh, that are able, would you kneel with me as we have a word of prayer? Father in heaven, thank you again for your tender, loving grace. Thank you again for your faithfulness, and thank you again for the Sabbath which we've had, and now we've entered into a new week. According to your word, from even unto even. And so now, dear Lord, we just pray you would be with us in this service. We're grateful for all the things that you have shared. Now, Lord, bring us through to the end, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so let us go ahead and sing a song or two. And let me... All right, so if you would turn with me in your song books to song number 67, someone will enter the pearly gates. Did you know that somebody's going to enter? I plan on being there. I don't know about anybody else, but I plan on being there. All right, song number 67. Two, three. Someone will enter the pearly gate. By and by, by and by. Taste of the glories that there await. Shall you, shall I, shall you, shall I. Someone will travel the streets of gold. Beautiful visions will there behold. Feast on the pleasures so long foretold. Shall you, shall I, shall you, shall I? Someone will gladly his cross lay down. By and by, by and by. Faithfully approved, which she re shall receive a crown. Shall you, shall I, shall you, shall I? Someone the glorious king will see. Ever from sorrow of earth be free. Happy with him through eternity. Shall you, shall I, shall you, shall I? Someone will knock when the door is shut. By and by, by and by. Hear a voice saying, I know you not. Shall you, shall I, shall you, shall I? No, no. Uh, I apologize. All right, let's just start it over. Someone will knock when the door is shut. By and by, by and by. Hear a voice saying, I know you not. Shall you, shall I, shall you, shall I? Someone will call and shall not be heard. Vainly will strive when the door is barred. Someone will fail of the saints' reward. Shall you, shall I, shall you, shall I? Someone will sing the triumphant song by and by, by and by. Join in the praise with the blood brought thong. Shall you, shall I, shall you, shall I? Someone will greet on the golden shore. Loved ones of earth, pain and parting o'er. Safe in the glory forevermore. Shall you, shall I, shall you, shall I? Somebody's going to sing that song wonderfully, by and by. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and turn to our next song. Song number 103, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. All right, 103. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to veil his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant and blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, Oh, may I then in him be found, Clad in his righteousness alone, Faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Does anyone have a song that they would like to sing? What number is that? Song number 120. We know not the hour. All right. All right. You pick it. You start it. Oh, hold on one second. Hold on. Hold, 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 hold. Let's start all together. Ready? We know not the hour of the master's appearing. Yet signs all foretell that the moment is nearing. When he shall return, tis a promise most cheery. But we know not the hour. He will come. Let us watch and be ready. He will come. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He will come in the clouds of his Father's bright glory. But we know not the hour. There's light for the wise who are seeking salvation. There's truth in the book of the Lord's revelation. Each prophecy points to the great consummation, but we know not the hour. He will come, let us watch and be ready. He will come, hallelujah, hallelujah. He will come in the clouds of his Father's bright glory. But we know not the hour. We'll watch and we'll pray with our lamps trimmed and burning. We'll work and we'll wait till the Master's returning. We'll sing and rejoice, every omen discerning. But we know not the hour. He will come, 
Let us watch and be ready. He will come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He will come in the clouds of his Father's bright glory. But we know not the hour. All right, so our opening song is going to be the song just below that song 121, Yield Not to Temptation. Would you all stand with me as we sing? Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you. Some other to win. Fight manfully onward. Dark passion subdue. Look ever to Jesus. He will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. Shine evil companions, bad language disdain. God's name hold in reverence, nor take it in vain. Be thoughtful and earnest. Kind-hearted and true, look ever to Jesus, he'll carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you, he will carry you through. To him that overcometh, God giveth a crown. Through faith we shall conquer, though often cast down. He who is our Savior, our strength will renew. Look ever to Jesus. He will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. All right, we'll bring the man of God forward. powerful word of prayer our father in heaven in the name of Jesus we come to you now and as we close the Sabbath day and we prepare to in this day completely depart and go our separate ways Lord we pray still for the blessing of your Holy Spirit as we open your word in Jesus name we pray amen, amen. so I have to apologize as first and foremost, I uh, just so you know, I had a few things planned in mind to share when I came. But tonight's message was something that I wanted to share as a result of a conversation that we had on Wednesday night. Some things that were said on Wednesday night. And I wanted to walk you through some, some uh, events that have taken place just to show you some laws that had been passed and, um, you know, went all the way back to, um, I think, even Gerald Ford. And you would see that um, uh, whether Democrat or Republican, they all have the same agenda. You know, they get us going back and forth over... Uh, uh, um, Party issues, stem cell research, offshore drilling, uh, uh, abortion. These are things that the people 
can pick up on and we make those the most important issues in debates and we focus on which one we want and we choose the lesser of two evils when we go out and we vote for candidates. And uh, one thing first and foremost, the prophet of the Lord says that we shouldn't be involved in the voting process simply because we cannot be, uh, we don't know the people that we're putting into office. And she says that we'll be responsible for the sins that they commit in office. And so we, what we say is the lesser two evils, you know, and you think about it. And I'll just speak for Obama. I'll go back to Obama because I remember, uh, and I, you know, I'll, I'll tell the truth right off the back. The only reason why I was glad Obama was a president, he was a black man. No other reason. He had no policies I cared about. He had nothing, you know, I followed the, the primary was very interesting between him and Hillary Clinton. It was very, very entertaining. But and so I started asking people, you know, you know, a couple of family members, you know, they went out and voted. I didn't vote. And uh, and I said, I started doing, you know, how Jimmy Kimmel and all of them, they'll say, well, what, what, what do you like? What did he do? And I asked a, a relative, I said, Tell me one of the policies that he likes. And they said, Obamacare. I said, tell me one of the things that, that he did that you liked, that benefited you. Obamacare. I said, how did that benefit you? Well, it benefited other people. I said, what did it do for you? Well, nothing. They got insurance without Obamacare. They didn't need Obamacare, right? And so there was nothing that they could tell me of his policies. And they do that with every president. They did it with George Bush. They did it with Bill Clinton. They did it with Donald Trump. And you find that people don't know the politician. They don't know what they're, they don't know their policies. They don't know the things that they promote. And so from Gerald Ford, at least, I think that may have been the earliest president. There may be some earlier. We could see that although they have policies, party policies, talking points, that looks like they're at odds against each other. But you would find that one law laid by one, a Republican, and then a Democrat comes on and guess what he does? He adds to that. And then he adds to that. And then the next one down. And we could see a train of a train all the way down to Donald Trump. That was the last one that was in the study. But guess what happened? I don't have it on my hard drive here. And it's, it is of no use unless you could read those laws and see them with me. There are quite a few of them because, like I said, it went from president to president. And it shows basically this. So I can only paraphrase. I'm sorry, I don't have it. I can only paraphrase. It shows that, um, and I did this research as well. Uh, I did this this morning. Joe Biden. Remember, we talked about national emergency, the, that our country was in a state of national emergency. That was on March 13th, 2020. Joe Biden in April of this year rescinded that law only for medical purposes. So he rescinded it April. Uh, uh, I forgot the date. I think it was April 19th of this year but only for medical purposes. But under a national emergency, we have no rights, saints. They could confiscate transportation. They could confiscate the, uh, the, the airways for the radio. They could confiscate farming equipment. They could confiscate food. They could confiscate land. We already know they could take your land from you. You already know that you don't own the house that you live in. You don't own the ground that your house is on. We know that, right? It's called eminent domain. And so they could take your house. They could actually relocate whole communities if they so desired. And under these laws, not only that, the, the federal government has the right to, under a national emergency, they have the right to uh, operate their own in, uh, independent prisons. And they could deputize anyone else that they want on a federal level. They could also enforce labor you know what that's called the law says that right now it's on the books and we are in a point and those laws they just kept adding to them 
Patriot Act, Patriot Act II, uh, uh, Military Commission Act, all of these laws, they just continued to add to them to the point that under a national emergency, the federal government has total control. When I say total, saints, I mean if you live in the United States, total. But we don't see the effects of it. Those laws have been passed and we don't see the effects of it. So therefore, hey, everything's okay. But I can't show it to you and I'm so sorry because I don't have that, those files with me and I wanted to show you those laws. And of course, I can't remember all of them off the top of my head. So um, I, I don't think, I, I don't know if I'll need it. So I just put it there just in case. So what I, we were talking and what um, we were saying we were gonna do this evening is, uh, and I'm going to give you the opportunities. You could interject, ask questions, even redirect if you so desire. But I had some verses that uh, the saints at the church had asked me about before. Some very difficult, controversial verses in the Bible. And uh, we were going to look at those, some of these tough verses. There are only three of them. And see if we can see exactly what the Bible is saying about it. All right. And the three verses are this. Number one. Uh, boy, I forgot. Uh, baptism for the dead. Have you ever heard of baptism for the dead? The Mormons teach the teaching of baptism for the dead found in first Corinthians chapter 15. I'd like to see what that is actually talking about. And the purpose of that is. For Bible study. What we're going to do tonight, these three verses that we're going to look at baptism for the dead, the sign of Jonah, and uh, uh, you can eat whatever you want as long as you pray over it. All right? You can eat whatever you want as long as you pray over it. Those three things I uh, wanted to take a look at um, and see what the Bible says about them. So uh, let's let's go and you could redirect. You could ask questions. You could stop me in the middle. I actually would prefer that if you did. So if you had any questions, you had any comments, you want to interject at any time, feel free to do so. So, um, Pastor Smith, which one should we go to first? Let's turn in our Bibles to first Corinthians chapter 15 and let's see what the word of God says. First and foremost, the book of Ezekiel tells us that though Daniel, Noah and Job were in the land, they shall save their own self by their righteousness. There is nothing that that I can do that's going to ensure your salvation. There's something that I can do that can assist. I could teach you a principle. I could reveal the character of Christ. But there's nothing that I could do to make sure that you are going to be saved. I remember studying with the, with the Mormons. You know, they, they, I, I always let them come to the house. When they knock on the door, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness, when they come in the house, when the Mormons, when they come to the house, what I will do is I'll say, come on in. Come on in. Sit down. Teach me something. What are you going to teach me? What do you have? Guess what, saints? Don't run from those experiences. God just sent you a free Bible study. You didn't knock on anybody's door. You didn't go anywhere. God sent somebody to your house for you to study with. Even if you get confused during the study, even if you don't know how to answer the questions, even if they got your head all twisted up, guess what? You at least know, you say this in your mind, huh, I don't know how to answer that. I'm going to go back and study for myself. You now are strengthened. You know there's a success that comes from failure. The prophet of the Lord says about Paul, when he was knocked off the horse, when he was blinded, he went and he went and he deepened his repentance. When he left from there to deepen after deepening his repentance, you know what the first thing he did? One of the first things he did rather, he went to his teachers all of his scholars, all of his friends in the Jewish economy. And he said, listen, you guys, we've been together for many, many years. I got to show you something. They didn't want to hear anything that Paul had to say. 
They didn't want to hear it. But the prophet of the Lord says about that experience that Paul learned a valuable lesson. And he learned in that apparent failure because she says it didn't bring the success that he was looking for. And he learned that in that experience, hey man, when I go to teach from now on, I need the Holy Spirit to do the teaching. She said that's what he learned. He learned that he can't labor for God in his own strength. Failures, apparent failures. I use that word apparent specifically because sometimes what is a failure to you is success to God. You know what true success is? I say true success is doing what God asked you to do. Jesus's ministry would have appeared to have been a failure. When he died on the cross, he had two converts. Simon of Cyrene and the thief on the cross. He had one more after he died, the centurion. But look how bad his ministry was. They had to find somebody to carry the cross. He should have had 11 men that were tripping over themselves trying to carry that cross for him. He should have had people running up saying, man, I'll take that cross. His own disciples were in the crowd and they wouldn't even labor. They wouldn't lift a hand for Jesus in that moment. That, that, that appears like a failure. But it's the greatest event that this world has ever seen, not will ever see. Because the greatest event that this earth will ever see is one that I pray I'll be alive to see. I don't want to be woken up from the grave saying, hey, Jesus came. Boy, you should have saw it. I want to be alive to see that cloud the size of a smith of man's fist that turns into Christ coming with the clouds of glory. I don't know what I'm asking for, but that's the greatest event this world will ever see. Jesus Christ coming again. And I want to be there and I want to be amongst those that say, lo, this is our God. So first Corinthians chapter 15, let's go to verse 28 immediately and then we'll go backwards. Not verse 28. Sorry, I gave you the wrong verse. Verse 29. Listen to this verse. The Bible says in verse 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? And so what the brothers tell me is that what you can do is if your loved one has never accepted Christ, they could be you could be baptized for them and they could accept Christ in the afterlife and then go to heaven. I said, well, look, man, I said, well, let me tell you something, man. Let's make a deal. I said, between me and you, let's make a deal. What I'm going to do is I'm going to live however I want to live. I said, man, I'm going to tear it up. I said, and what I want you to do is when I die, I want you to get baptized for me so that I can go to heaven. And I said, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to plan to get baptized for you. So you, man, you might as well keep knocking on doors. You might as well just go and sin and live however you want to. And then after you die, You can go to heaven. He said, no, it don't work that way. I said, why? He said, that's just not how it works. I said, why? And he couldn't answer the question. But that makes sense, right? I I have another chance. And that's what Satan wants us to believe. And he does it through various ways. He wants us to believe that we have another opportunity. That's why we put off for tomorrow what we should be doing today because we believe we got more time. All right. So what does this mean to be baptized for the dead? This to answer this question, we have to study this chapter and we have to study it contextually, meaning we look at the context of first the surrounding verses and then the verses of the whole chapter. Let's see what it's talking about in order to understand specifically what that singular verse is talking about. So let's start in verse one and we're going to break this up in various portions. All right. Verse one says this. Paul gives a lot of salutations to the church. He says, moreover, brethren, verse one, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand. So number one, Paul is reaffirming 
the gospel. Amen. Do you see that, saints? Nobody answered me. Pastor Smith, do you see that he's reaffirming? Okay. So number one, he's reaffirming the gospel. Let's go on. He says, as a matter of fact, not only is he reaffirming the gospel, but listen to what he goes on to say. By which also are ye saved, if ye keep in memory that with what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, now he's talking about what he shared with them. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins. Remember what we talked about uh, Wednesday night? That the gospel is Jesus died for our sins. He lives to keep us free from sin. And soon he's coming again to redeem us from this stain of sin. That's the gospel. And so he's talking about the gospel. And the gospel, the portion that he is describing, is the death of Christ. So he says... I preached this gospel and the gospel was of the death of Christ. That's all he said so far. Let's go on. Then it says in verse four and that he was buried and that he did what rose again. So not only that Christ died, but he rose or the resurrection. All right, let's go on. And then he goes on with some more small talk. He was seen of Cephas verse six. He was seen of 500 brethren at one time, verse, uh, that's verse 6. And then verse 7, he was seen of James. At verse 8, he was seen of me. Verse 9, I'm the least of the apostle. So he's just given more evidence that Jesus did rise from the grave. That's why he named all of those names. If you don't believe me, go ask them. They are still alive at this time. You don't believe that Jesus rose? Go ask them. They know. They were there. They saw him. And so he's just given evidence that Jesus rose. We're going forward. It says, but by the grace of God, I am. And that's some more small talk. Verse 10. Then he says this in verse 11. Therefore, whether it be I or they, so we preached and so ye believed. So this gospel that Jesus died and rose the Bible says they believed it. All right. So what is he talking about so far? The death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you believed it when I preached it to you the first time. Let's move on. Verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. So what's happening now? What has happened here is the doctrine of the Sadducees has crept into the Christian church. The doctrine of the Sadducees was there was no resurrection of the dead. Do you remember they asked Jesus, you say that there's a resurrection. What happens if a, a woman dies? And she ends up with seven husbands. You, you understand? Did you remember that, that, that story? She, the first husband died, no children. The next one died, no children. The third one all the way up to the seventh. And then he dies and they go, they said, who she's gonna, whose husband she is gonna, she gonna, hmm, who's gonna be her husband in heaven? Jesus said, you don't understand the resurrection, no, resurrection nor the power of God. All right? So that's what they were trying to trip Jesus up with, the fact that there was no resurrection. So it goes on to say, and it said, verse 14, and if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain and your faith also vain. So stop right here. At this point in time, who did they say was dead? If they believed that teaching of the Sadducees, who did they say was dead? Christ. So Christ, even though we say death here. If there's no resurrection, Paul says Christ is still dead. Key point to understand. Verse 15, ye, uh, yea, and we are fo found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not for if the dead rise not, 
and he repeats himself, then Christ is not raised or he's still dead. And if Christ be dead, you're uh, uh, not raised. Sorry, your faith is in vain and ye are yet in your sins. And so now he goes on to talk about death. He goes on to reaffirm the resurrection. He says, verse 20, but now Christ then, uh, now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now, we won't read all through all of these verses because what he's doing now from verse 20 all the way down to 28, he's once again reaffirming the gospel and he's reaffirming the fact that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. All right. So we're together thus far. But then all of a sudden, I mean, let me ask you this. In verse 1 through 28, has he talked about baptism yet? He, he, so the subject of this chapter is not baptism at all. Is that fair? The subject matter of this chapter is Christ has risen from the dead and we shouldn't be listening to those preachers that are telling you something different than that. Amen? That's the context of what Paul is trying to teach. But then we go to verse 28. Sorry, verse 29. The Bible says this in verse 29. Else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? So it sounds as if in this verse, he said somebody is being baptized for the dead if the dead don't rise, right? Let me ask you something before we answer this question. Why are we baptized? Now I need a, I need a point blank specific answer. I want you to narrow it down to its bare minimum. All right? Yes. That's a good answer. That's a true statement to testify of our death to self. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward change. There's no sanctity in baptism. I won't say any more. What were you getting ready to say? All right, again, same thing. An outward expression of an inward change. We're declaring to the world that there's been a change in our life. Yes, sir. Demonstration of a new life. We walk in newness of life. As a matter of fact, let me just show you all of what you said is true. Look what the Bible says in the book of Romans. Hold your finger there in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at Romans, the book of Romans chapter 6. Look what the Bible says in Romans chapter 6. And we're going to look at verse 3. The Bible says this. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Know ye not? That so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we be buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's what baptism is. Amen. So give me another reason. I want I want you to go down to the bare minimum. Why else are we baptized? All of those are true. Yes. To die to self. Amen. Two more. I want to get, I, I need two more answers. Let me see if we're going to get it. All right, Pastor Smith. Why are we baptized? Something different than what anybody else said. We chose that we're married to Christ. Married to Christ. Partake of the resurrection with Christ. All of those are true. But let me show you the bare minimum of why we do what we do. God told us to. It can't get no simpler than that. Am I right? If God told us to spray ourselves with water, guess what we'll be doing? We'd be sprinkling. If God told us to roll around in mud, we'd be rolling around in mud. We are baptized. We are immersed as a symbol of his death, burial, and resurrection, and we do it because God told us to. 
Can't get any simpler than that. Right. So now watch the question then. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're ready to answer this question and end this portion. The Bible says in verse 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Who is the dead that was mentioned in this chapter? Why are we baptized? Because Christ told us to. And so what he's saying is, why are you baptized for Christ if Christ doesn't rise? Are you, are you, do you see it? The context of the chapter is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The reason why we are baptized is to symbolize our marriage relationship, our union with Christ, our newness of life. Why are you baptized if Jesus didn't rise? That's what he's saying. Why are you getting baptized if Jesus didn't rise? At no point is this being mentioned here of, of, of other people who are the dead. Christ was the dead in this chapter. And he's saying it, as a matter of fact, let me give you another verse about Paul. A lot of times, listen what, the, listen what Peter says about Paul. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Listen what Peter says about Paul. 2 Peter chapter 3, sorry, and verse 15. Listen what Paul, what Peter says about Paul. The Bible says this, 2 Peter Chapter 3 and verse 15, the Bible says, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles. How many? All his epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things. What saints? Why? Because Paul has a very intellectual language. Paul used a lot of symbolisms. Paul used, uh, as a matter of fact, another one of those difficult verses, which, which is too long for us to do tonight is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where the Bible speaks of baptism, not baptism for the dead, uh, absent from the body, present with the Lord. He uses, and, and, and in, that, in that chapter, he's talking about, he references our body as being a house. And he's always using this flowerly language where you have to decipher what Paul is saying. You got to spend some time in prayer. Lord, what you mean? What are you trying to say? Because these writers. What's 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 amazing about these writers is God let them write what he wanted them to write from their experience. You think of the ministers that have been on this pulpit. You think of the people, the ministers that have come here and preached. Some have said the same thing. They said it in different ways. The delivery was different. The tone of voice is different. They give it to you from their experience. They share testimonies of various things that have taken in place in their life from their experience. And Paul writes from his experience some things that are hard to be understood. Baptism for the dead was a reference of being baptized for Christ. And he said there's no need to if. Christ did not rise from the dead. That's what that verse is talking about. Any questions? Do you get it, saints? Okay, that was easy. That was easy. Okay, all right, which one's next? Number two is going to be the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah, all right. Turn in your Bibles. Let's go to the book of Matthew. Now, you remember the principle when this sign of Jonah uh, uh, came up. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Matthew. Give me a second, saints. All 
All right. And we're going to go to verse, verse 39. Matthew, oh, sorry. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 39. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 39 is where we're going to go. Let me get this here and I'm going to waste it. You know, I want to praise God that I'm able to dry this board off, wipe that board clean. I had rotator cuff surgery uh, back in May and about, I don't know, maybe two months ago, two and a half months ago, <clears throat> I couldn't do this. So I want to praise God that I'm healing good. I'm still in therapy and the arm is coming along with they're building my strength now. The Bible says in verse 39. But he answered and said unto them, and an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now watch this. According to your knowledge. When did Jesus die? Friday night. Amen. So Friday in the evening. Then we have the Sabbath. That's a day. And that's a night. When did Jesus rise? Sunday morning. What do you have there? <laughs> I like that answer. He had, you have three days. That's a true statement. But what you don't have is three days and three nights. Now, I've heard the statement. I've heard the argument that in the Jewish economy, any portion of the day is considered a day. Fair. But the Bible did not say three days. You look at when it says uh, of Jesus, it says he would rise on the third day. But when it talks about the son of Jonas, it talks about him being three days and three nights. This verse is used by some to show that guess what? Sunday is the Sabbath in the Bible and we got it wrong. Why? Because if I add another night here and then I bring up Monday, then I'll have three days and three nights. That is incorrect. Just so you're not confused at all about what I'm trying to say. That is wrong. So in order to understand what the sign of Jonas is, let's go to Jonah's life. Turn your Bibles to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. And I want to read one portion in chapter one. Chapter one and verse and verse 17. I just want to read this one thing in 117 and then we're going to chapter two. All right. 117, the Bible says, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. All right. So the time frame is the same. It's not just three days where it's any portion of the day considered three days, but it's three days hmm, and three nights. All right. So now let's see what Jonah said. The Bible says in verse one, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. So this is key to understand that he's in the fish's belly when he says what he says. Listen what he says. And I said, 
and said, I, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of what? All right, saints. What does the word hell mean? There are two words for hell in the Greek and in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, it's Sheol. In the Greek, it is Hades, where people say Hades. It's pronounced Hades. There are two words, Sheol and Hades. In the Greek, Hades means the grave. In the Hebrew, Sheol means the grave. Hell means the grave. You look that up when you get home. You check and check and see. You know, we got Strong's Concordance. You can look and see what that word means in the original language. And so was Jonah in the grave? No, he may have thought he was. He may have thought that was his grave. But he wasn't in the grave. Let's keep going. And said, I cried by, oh, I read that part. He cried out of belly to hell and, and, and cried, I, and thou hurtst my voice. Verse three, for thou hast cast me into the deep. So Jonah's in the deep. He is in the deep at this time. But then it goes on to say in the midst of the seas. So Jonah is in the deep. He's in the seas. You're going to see why we're putting this up there. And then it says, and the floods come past him. The floods come past me about all thy billows and thy wave passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters come past me about even to the soul. The depths clothed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. All of those things probably literally happened to Jonah. But listen to what else it says. I went down to the bottoms of the mountain. The earth with her bars were about me forever Yet thou has brought up my life from corruption. What are these bars? Let's, let's, let's deal with the bars right now. Look what the Bible says. Let's do the bars right now. Hold your finger in, jo, in jo, uh, um, Jonah and go to Job, J-O-B, chapter 17. The book of Job, chapter 17. All right. Job chapter 17, and we're going to read verse 16. Listen what these bars, the Bible says in verse 16, thou shall go down to the bars of the pit when our rest together is where? Once again, he's talking about the grave. So he wasn't. He didn't go to the bottom of the mountains. I remember I said that one time and the brother said, well, how do we know? Maybe the whale did go down to the bottom of the mountain. Well, Jonah did not know where he was at. And so we have to conclude at least that portion was figurative language. As a matter of fact, how we know it is because he's praying this prayer. And he said he prayed this prayer while he was in the belly of the whale. Now I know he wrote this later, so he probably included the fact that he didn't, he brought me up and I didn't see corruption after he was spit out by the whale, because he wrote it after. So let's go in the book of Psalms now. And what I want us to see is that this experience, this deep, the seas, the flood come past him and He's in the grave, but he does not come up. Uh, well, he does not see corruption and God raises him up. We're going to see that this is Christ's experience, this very thing. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Psalms. We're going to go to Psalms 69. Psalm 69. Psalms 69, and we're going to go to, well, let's start in verse 1. 
Psalm 69 and verse 1, the Bible says, Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into what, saints? Deep waters. So he come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. So let me ask you something. Where in the Bible do we see David being compassed about in deep waters? What story is that? Goliath? Hmm. We don't see David being in deep water, right? Okay. Let's see if David's talking figuratively. Let's go to verse 14 of the same chapter. Verse 14. What was David saying when he said that he was in deep waters? All right. Listen to what the Bible says. Verse 14. Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me de be delivered from whom? From them that hate me and out of the what? So the deep waters were those that did what? There you go. So that was, uh, I'm just going to say hateful people. I don't know what else to say. They were hateful people that deep waters, because what are the seas, saints, in prophecy? Peoples, nations, multitudes, and tongues. Deliver me from the deep waters. Deliver me from those that hate me. Look at verse 15. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Do you remember? Oh, I forgot to point that. I forgot to point it out to you. Maybe your mind remembers in the verse that we just read, Job 6, 17, 16, where he said, uh, 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 um, the bars of the pit is when we rest together in the dust. Let's just... Uh, Let's turn back. Just hold your finger here. Turn back to Job 17, verse 16. I should have brought that point out. I forgot. Sorry. 17, 16 links the bars and the pit together. The Bible says in verse 16, they shall go down, Job 17, 16, to the bars of the pit when our rest together is in the dust. And I forgot to write these bars here or this pit as well they're one and the same in verse 15 of the chapter we just read in psalms he says let not the water flood overflow me neither let the deep swallow me up and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me same language as jonah's experience but in david's experience the deep was hateful people and this the seas we already know our people as well. People, nations, multitudes, and tongues. We're just going to write people there. Let's go to another verse in Psalms. Let's go to Psalm 69. No, we're in, yep, we're in 69. Um, huh? This brother knows my study. Let's see. 18. I like 18. Go to 18. Yes. Go to verse 4. Chapter 18 and verse 4. Now what verse are you bringing? Uh, I just said verse 4. So never mind. 18 and verse 4. I was getting ready to say which one. Is that one you was referring to? Well, let's look at verse 4. This is a good one. Look what the Bible says in Psalms 18. And verse 4, and we're going to go to verse 4 and 5. Now watch this now. This is so key. Watch this. Verse 4 says, the sorrows of death come past me. I'm going to write that. Sorrow of death. Sorrows of death compass me, the floods 
of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of death come past him. And he says the floods of ungodly men. So these floods are ungodly men. And it goes on to say in verse five, the sorrows of hell come past me about the snares of death prevented me. So Jesus said that the sign of Jonas is what's going to uh, be given to those who ask for a sign in his day. So he was likening his experience to Jonah's experience. Where do we see in Jesus's experience him being compassed about with ungodly men, threatened with death, and the sorrows of death prevented him? Where do we see Jesus having that experience? Look what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 26. That is absolutely correct. Look what Matthew chapter 26 says. We see all of that taking place in Matthew chapter 26. And we were going to go to verse. We'll start. In verse 38. Bless you. We see Jesus asking the disciples to spend some time in prayer with him. As a matter of fact, it was the very prayer that Christ was asking them to participate in that would have strengthened them for the trial that was ahead. Sometimes our angel is trying to wake us up because he knows what we got to deal with that day. God says, hey, man, get him up, man. He's going to have a hard day today. He just don't know it. I need to spend some time with him. I got to strengthen him. He got some trials that's getting ready to come his way. He getting ready to get in an accident. He getting ready to total that brand new car that he, man, I don't know if he's going to be able to handle it without prayer. Amen? And we say, Lord, not now. I'll pray later. I don't feel like it. And God says, man, I want to strengthen you for the day's labor. But the Bible says in verse, uh, um, verse 38, then said he unto him, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch for me. And he goes away and he prays a little bit more. But then Jesus comes back. And in verse 47, when he comes back, the Bible says, and while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the 12 came and with him a great multitude Peoples, nations, multitudes, and tongues, a sea, a flood of people came with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. And then they bound Jesus, they compassed him about, and they took him away. And so this experience that he related to Jonah was the experience that began in the Garden of Gethsemane. Why did he give them that sign? Because Jesus wanted to reveal to them before they did what they did. I'm going to give you the sign. When you see it, know so that they would not do it. Jesus didn't want them to be. Jesus was going to die anyways, but it didn't have to be his people. He loved each and every one of them, even those that came to take him away. And so this experience took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. So let me ask you something. Where do we, what day was the Garden of Gethsemane? That was a Thursday. Thursday, because all night, the prophet of the Lord says that everything Satan and evil angels could think of was heaped upon Christ. Let your imagination run. They did it to Jesus. Stripped him naked, saints. He was a virgin. Yeah, they beat him, stripped the man naked and put him on the cross and let him hang there naked. The Bible says I could tell my bones 
The cat of nine tails was a whip that used to had nine lashes on it. And they would intermingle blood. They would intermingle pieces of bone, rocks and glass in the braids. So it wasn't the sting of the whip that would hurt. It was when the whip would wrap around your body and then they would pull it back and it would dig into the skin and it would rip away skin and flesh. He received it twice. 40 lashes twice. I could tell all my bones. And so now what do we have then? So Sunday still. I'm sorry. Still not the Sabbath. Thursday night. He was compassed about with ungodly men. He was in the heart of the earth. We, we assume that that heart of the earth, as a matter of fact, hmm. Let's go to a verse. Let's look at the Bible in the book of Genesis. Before we finish that statement, look what Genesis chapter Genesis says. Genesis chapter six. Look what the Bible says here. Verse five. Look at the Genesis chapter six. Genesis chapter six, verse five. Listen to what it says. The Bible says. And God saw the wickedness of man was great. Where at? In the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved his heart. And so God says that the earth was wicked. Why was the earth wicked? Because men's heart was wicked. So the heart of man was wicked. And because of that, God destroyed mankind from the earth. So the heart of the earth is not the center of the earth. This special place, this special uh, hell uh, that, 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 that's on the earth. But the heart of the earth is the heart of man. And so here... We have his first night, Friday, he was before Herod, Friday morning, he was before Pilate, Friday night, he was in the grave, Saturday, all day, he was in the grave, and he rose Sunday morning, three nights and three days. Any questions? Does that make sense, saints? Come on now, you got to challenge me. If it don't make sense, you got to say, hey, pastor, that don't work. You know, don't let me keep teaching this if it don't work. Okay. No questions, no comments. It sounds good. Okay, let's keep it moving. Pastor, oh, the last one. All right. Last one is. Uh, Is being in the ground being dead? Was he dead on Thursday? No. See, good. Thank you for asking the question. Thank you. She said, is being in the ground meaning he's dead? It didn't say he was in the ground. What it said, he was in the heart of the earth. If you go back to Matthew, uh, we it says that as the son of, as, as, uh, let's go back to Matthew chapter 12. Let me, let's see that very clearly. Matthew chapter 12. And look what verse uh, 30, uh, verse 49 says. It doesn't say he's in the grave. What it says is that he would be in the heart of the earth. The heart of the earth is the heart of man. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And what we just did is we see that in that Jonah's experience, 
was he was compassed about with hateful people, those floods and the sorrows of death. All of this took place for Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane while he was alive, while he was compassed about with ungodly men. And so all while he was in their grasp, that's when the, the reckoning began. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. We ready? All right. Let's go to our last one. We're going to go to first Timothy chapter four. You have heard people say, maybe you have, maybe you have not. We could eat whatever we want as long as we pray over it. Amen. And they'll use this verse to say it. So we're going to go to first Timothy chapter four and I'm going to clear this off right now. Not it. It's empty. I checked over there. Oh, okay. All right. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 4 is where we're going. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now, here we're in another one of Paul's letters, and we're actually going to go to a couple of more of his letters as we read this. So, whatever comment, if you don't get it, I want you to, I want you to interject, Okay. I want you to say, hey, Pastor, what about this? What about that? OK, I, I want you to uh, I want to make sure you understand this, the, the thought process. So the Bible says in verse one. Now, the spirit speaketh expressly. That in the latter days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with iron. So we know that what they teach is going to be a lie. Now listen to what they teach. Forbidding to marry and commanding, and this is the point we want to look at because we're going to talk about the diet right now. Commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know of the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. All I got to do is pray over it. I can eat whatever I want to. Right. That's what it says. That's not what it says. I want you to pay attention to the wording right here. The Bible says that nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. So number one. We have to be thankful for it and then we could receive it. But listen to what it says in verse three, the prior verse. The lie is forbidding to abstain from meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving. That lets you know right there that God is in only talking about that which he has given to be received. Does that make sense? No, you didn't get it. All right. So let me see. How can I say it a different way? I'll say it this way. <clears throat> I'll say it this way. Can I thank God? You know, what's a good gift? A good gift, the Bible says that if a man finds a virtuous woman, he has found a good thing. Is that true? Therefore, a virtuous woman to a man is a blessing from God. Right? Right. So can I say thank you to God for giving me a virtuous woman if I already have a wife? I can't thank God for that. 
to, everybody didn't answer Pastor Smith. Everybody didn't say, everybody didn't agree with me just then. So I can't say thank you for something that God never intended for me to have. That's what this is saying. Which God hath created. That means there are some things that God created to be received with thanksgiving. That's the first qualifying part of that verse. As a matter of fact, oftentimes we see the word meats in the Bible and we think it's uh, some steak or some fried chicken. But the Bible doesn't call meats always meats. We call them meats. The Bible calls it flesh. As a matter of fact, look what the Bible calls meat. Hold your finger here in this verse because we're going to come back to this. Look what the Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 30. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 30. The Bible says this. And to every beast of the field and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for what? So if we just if we just use the Bible terminology right off the top, God is not even talking about flesh food. But let's just assume that he is. Let's just assume that he is. Let's just make that assumption he is talking about because there are things that God has created to be received with thanksgiving. And then there are things that God has not been received, uh, not created to be received with thanksgiving. So we start off by saying, how do I know what God has created to be received and what not to be received? Is that fair? Are we together so far? Any questions, any comments before I move forward? Are we together so far? Okay. Okay. So then what we do then is we go to the book of Leviticus and we start scrolling through the book of Leviticus and we start to look and we can go to, we could go to multiple chapters. We could go to chapter 11 uh, of the book of, that's one of the best chapters there, but it's all over the place where God says what he has made to be eaten. And, you know, and what he has not made to be eaten. Yes. Um, so I'm not um, of a contrary belief, but I lately read Deuteronomy and it was confusing. That it was what? I, I came across something confused me. Because I read um, before he gave the law of what to eat and what not to eat. It says, um, eat whatever pleases you. And if you want me to look for it, I'll look for it. Yeah, yeah. You show it, me. It, it, it'd be good to show the verse and then. Yeah. And that's, but let's just. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I cut you off. Go ahead. No, and, and then it gives a law and he says, okay, don't, you know, don't eat these things. It's an abomination. Mm-hmm. And then I think there's a verse even after that. Go ahead and eat whatever pleases you. Mm -hmm. So it was confusing to me why, why that is. All right. I'll give you. I don't even. I, you could find that verse. And in, in, in by finding that verse, it may give us more information. But I'm just going to go off of what you said. I'm going to assume that everything you said was an exact quotation of the Bible. And let's just begin right there. Right. So God says, do whatever you want. Right. Well, he says that all through the Bible. Look what he says in the book of Ecclesiastes. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. And he says in, in chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. He says the same thing. In the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 11, but it's not dealing with food in this area. It's dealing with our lifestyle. So he says to us, do whatever you want to do. But listen to what, let's qualify that statement. Listen to what the Bible says. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, the Bible says in verse 9. Are you there? Yes. 
The Bible says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart. Do what you want to do. And in the sight of thine eyes, whatever your eyes fall upon, man, do it. But, there's a but after that. But know thou that all these things God will bring into judgment. So he says, do what you want to do. I could show you a verse where God says, go and drink some mixed drinks. Go drink some strong drinks. He told the children of Israel, go on, fill your bottles up, drink and get drunk. That was, I don't know the, the right word for it. I don't know the, the right word for it, but it's almost, I, I guess since I don't know the right word, I'll say it this way. God was being sarcastic. I don't know if I'm using the right word for it. Facetious. facetious thank you. That's a good word. God was being facetious. And even in here, he's saying, do whatever you want to do. Just know you're going to have to pay the price for it. I mean, just think about it. Just think about it today. Let's just deal with, with eating in general today. You know that on Thanksgiving, you can eat however you want to. But you know that when you're done eating, huh, uh, you know how you're going to uh, you're going to have to pay for that. Amen. Do what you want to do. But there are consequences for your actions. And that's all that God is saying, at least here. So if there's more to that text, if you find it, we'll look at it. Go ahead. Deuteronomy 12, 15. Let's take a look. Deuteronomy 12, 15. And know and understand that Deuteronomy 12, 15 comes after God has already given, it's not before, that's after he has already given the clean and unclean meats. Go ahead. Right. So, well, Deuteronomy still is a book that comes after the, the book, the, the, the Torah, the, 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 these, these five books of Moses are in order. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy are in order. They're in chronological order. And so it, it, it comes after he has already given to them the clean and unclean meats in Leviticus. So you said Deuteronomy 12 and verse 10, 15. The Bible says, notwithstanding, thou mayest kill and eat flesh in all thy gates. Whatsoever thou so lustest after, according to the, oh man, here's a qualification right there. According to the blessing of the Lord. So you can eat whatever your heart lusts after, according. So there's a qualification there. According to the blessing of the Lord, thy God, which he hath given thee, the unclean, oh my goodness, I take that back. The unclean and the clean may eat thereof. As of the roebuck and as of the heart, only ye shall not eat the blood. Ye shall pour it upon the earth as water. Hmm. You got something there? I want to I want to hear what the pastor now, got to say about that. Yes, sir. No, the unclean and the clean is talking about the, the people. people. The it's people. not talking about the animals. I was but the heart and the roebuck are unclean meats. No, the heart and the roebuck are clean meats. The heart is a rabbit. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, Wait. so the heart and the robot is are unclean meats. Oh, I got gotcha. you. What's a roebuck? I thought that was just like a regular deer. Isn't that a deer? Sorry, I'm asking. I don't know. Let's go to Leviticus 11. Let's, let's see if I can get some understanding here. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 11 because it says in Leviticus chapter 11... Um, look up the word roebuck, Pastor. Look okay. up the word roebuck. I thought it said it here. It does not. It. Oh, the heart says a deer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what. So then I. They're both clean. They are both clean. I thought. As a heart panteth by the water brooks. As a heart panteth by the water. So that's that's, that's talking about both the that roebuck is. and the heart are similar. They're both Thank you, kinds sir. of deer. Thank you, sir. So in essence, let's read that again. 
Now, with that qualification, let's read that again. I thought that the heart was a rabbit. The Bible says, notwithstanding, thou mayest kill and eat the flesh in all thy gates, whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. But then it says, according to the blessing of the Lord. Thy God, which he have given the clean and yeah, the clean and unclean. It doesn't say we may eat. It says they may eat the clean and unclean may eat. And so I agree. I said the same thing in my mind, but this is talking about God, uh, the clean and unclean people. But I thought it was uh, a, a rabbit. So in essence, and we see this experience, watch this same experience, eat whatever you want. Watch this same experience. The children of Israel were getting manna from heaven. And they said, we loathe this bread. And God said, okay, what you want? We want some flesh. And God sent them quail. He sent them quail, the Bible says, until it came out of their nostrils. And so, uh, once again, you know, their heart lusteth after it. And, um, say it again. They got tired of it until it came out of their nose. But again, the context of first Timothy is dealing with what God has created to be received with thanksgiving. So you'll have someone that's coming along and they're saying, according there, they're saying you can't eat what God said you can eat. And so we have to look and see what God said we can eat. And what we can't eat. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Timothy, thank you, chapter 4, it said that the lie was people will tell you that you can't eat what God said you can eat. That's the lie. You can't eat it. But God said you can. And so we have to look, I'll come to you next. And we have to look and see what did God say I can eat? Because I can't give thanks to God. I can't say thank you to God for giving me something that he already told me I cannot have. I remember one time, you know, back in the days before I was a Christian, I had a car payment that was due. And I remembered my mother was telling me about prayer. And I said, okay. Lord, help me to pay this, this, this car note. It's due today. Help me to pay this car note. I prayed that prayer. I got the money. I didn't get it by right means. But I got the money. Can I thank God for giving me the money? That's a good answer. No, I cannot. I cannot say thank you for, to God for something that he already told me I cannot do. Yes. Huh. Praying over bad food gives me an idea about is it okay to take drugs against God's will? He said drugs don't cure, don't take them. Is it okay if we pray and say thank you God for the healing? <laughs> well, that actually is going to bring us on another topic that I actually going to step back from. I am not a person that takes pills. You know, uh, so I don't, you know, my mother, uh, she, the, the, matter of fact, Sister Washington just passed, a mother of our church. She just passed a few, a uh, little over a week ago. Do you know how amazed the doctor was that this woman was 80 something years old and she was not on a bit of medication? She wasn't taking any medication. She, she fell her death came about from an injury. And so, but she had, uh, uh, um, she had pneumonia. She had walking pneumonia. But she didn't, she wasn't on any medication. You know, I could show you a quote where the prophet of the Lord says that we should instruct people that drugs, just as you said, drugs don't cure. They just mask. Okay. But nonetheless, that's a process that we, uh, you know, um, we need to learn how to heal our bodies and to preserve our bodies. That's what Councils on Diets and Food said, so that we could re render more to God. 
But I'm not going to beat somebody. I'm not going to beat on people because modern medicine. You know, I had a I had a medical missionary one time I was in Sabbath school and they said to the teacher that was teaching, they said, how could he was a nurse? They said, how could you work for the hospital knowing that the hospital kills so many people? And God says this, that and the other. And everybody chimed in at this point and I waited for a minute and then I made a comment and I said, you know, me and my wife got into a car accident in Kingman, Arizona. I praise God, whole family almost died, tore the car up. We all are here today. I thank the Lord every time I look at those pictures preserving my family. But there was no sanitarium around. There was no med medical missionary that could pull up in an ambulance and come pick, pick us up. And so we were taken to the hospital and they tenderly cared for us. They cared for us. They took care of us. They treated us good in Kingman, Arizona. My wife had it rough in, in Vegas. But I said, until we get into a position, because listen, if my my son had a fractured jaw and I, I had something going on in my knee, they said I sprung some. So they put some wraps on us, you know, set some things. And I don't think anything's wrong with that, saints. I just told you I had surgery on my shoulder. Sister told me you should pray about it. Oh, she told me. And you know something? Maybe it's my lack of faith. Maybe her faith is strong enough. But I asked, what can I do? What is the remedy that I could do that could reattach a muscle? My muscle didn't tear. My muscle didn't just have a tear in it. It completely separated. It pulled back. I got pictures of it. I have an inch. My muscle pulled back up my shoulder about an inch. The gap between where that muscle was is about that fat. There's no herb that's going to reattach that muscle down there. There's no herb that's going to do that. There's no exercise that's going to make that muscle get back over there. That has to be done by surgery. And I got it. So let's get back to this. Let's get back to this. So I don't. I, I don't agree with modern medicine. I don't promote modern medicine, but modern medicine can help. But I don't promote drugs at all. Not at all. Huh? Pray for it. Can I pray for it? Uh, Oh, no, you can't pray for what God hasn't given, said you could have. That's what I, that's the point that this verse is trying to bring out. You can't pray over and bless what God has cursed. And so what has God cursed? You know, we could name them uh, various uh, 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 some of the most common, you know, swine, catfish, all of these type of things. But guess what else he has said you can't have? Food, uh, meat with blood in it. He said, don't eat any blood. He said, don't eat any fat. So if you're not eating kosher food, guess what? You're not, you can't say thank you for that. Yes, sir. Ah, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I like that verse. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's see what Paul's talking about in that verse. And that actually is talking about uh, uh, we find two places that is mentioned and we'll go to both of them. We'll go to first Corinthians chapter 10. We'll go to first Corinthians chapter eight. It's mentioned in both of those verses. Let's go to first Corinthians chapter 10 first. First Corinthians chapter 10. The context of this verse. The context of this verse was food that was offered to idols. Now, we could read the whole thing, but I would encourage you to read when you get home. The context of this one, as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 8, which we're going to ready to go to next, is food that is offered to idols. Okay? Remember, the word meats doesn't necessarily 
mean flesh food in the Bible. We know specifically God is talking about flesh food when he says flesh. But when he says meats, it could be talking about sweet potato pie. Listen what the Bible says. The Bible says, um, let's see. First Corinthians chapter 10. Um, the cup of blessing, verse 16. Let me see, where do I want to start? Let's start in verse 19. Let's start in verse 19. The Bible says, what say I then? That the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifice to the idol is anything. But I say that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the devils or the table of devils. Do we promote the Lord? And so he's talking about things offered to idols. But in this instance, he's talking about going to the store and buying food. That's what the shambles were. All right. All right. Before we go on, sister. Pass it to Mike. She has a question. Before we read on. I have a comment and a question. All right. Um, the comment, I meant the question is regarding um, the part where it says, Food, what you were talking about, it says that food offered to idols, mm -hmm. that's what we shouldn't eat. But then I've heard, too, where it's like, if you're, um, let's just say you do eat flesh food, if you're at somebody's house and then they offered you something, I know that it's, like, offensive to, if you refuse, just depending on where you are. And then, too, it's like, how would you know if, it, if it's something that's offered to an idol? That's good. This verse is going to answer that. That's exactly what this verse is going to answer. And I want you to keep in mind, we capes keep saying flesh, but at no time have we read the word flesh. At every time we have read meat. All right. So I want to keep that in mind that it's talking about we don't know. We just have to look and see what God said you can have and what he said you can't have. We have that information already. So with that information in mind, we move forward. Remember the verse in Hebrews, which says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. That means the same principles that applied that Christ laid down in times past are principles that we see today. Unless we see in the Bible where God says, like with the ceremonial law, they're done away with. We know that the sacrifices have been done away with. We see that in the word of God. So listen what the Bible says. We are at now verse, verse 24, 25. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that's the market, that eat, asking no question for what? So here's the point that's being made. Asking no question for Conscience sake. That's a key point, and we're going to see why. For the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. If any man then that believe not bid you to a feast and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question once again for conscience sake. So you could eat. Be, and have a good conscience. Want to see why? But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not. So at one point it says, Eat whatever you want to. Why? I'm going to answer why right here. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We'll hold your finger in this chapter. We're going to go back and forth. They're going to answer it. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's a market. It's exactly. That's the market. So look at what it says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to answer this conscience aspect right now. The Bible says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, the Bible says, and it's dealing with idol worship as well. Verse 4. 
as concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. We know this is why you don't have to worry about conscience. We know. First Corinthians chapter eight, and we're reading from verse four. All right. The Bible says. We know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. So Paul says you could offer to an idol all you want. There's no idol. It's God. So guess what? Those rice and peas are good. I don't care if you did offer them to idols, right? Because there's no God but God. That idol doesn't care that you offered any food to it. It does not perceive that. You understand? That's what he says his conscience is. Let's read on. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there are gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we are in him, and we in him, sorry, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. How be it? Here's why for conscience sake, how be it there is not in every man that conscious or uh, that knowledge for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as thing offered unto an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. And so he goes on to say back in the other chapter. So the idea here is he says, listen, my conscience is clear. Because I know there's no idols but God. So I can eat and be content. But some people don't know that there's no God. And they eat that food and... Say that again. No God? Okay, let's say it different then. Some people don't know that God is the only God. I'll say it that way. What I meant to say is they don't know that there is no God but God. And they think that those idols actually are something. And so because of that, they eat with that knowledge and their brain gets messed up because they're saying, man, I'm worshiping the devil. I'm doing pagan worship. I'm doing wrong. Well, it doesn't matter because there's no God besides God. So now let's go back to chapter 10. Let's go back to chapter 10 and let's see what he says about conscience. Verse 27 is where we left off. And so it says in verse 28, but if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake. That showeth it and for conscience sake. Verse 29, conscience I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? And then he goes on to say, uh, um, he says, um, oh, it's not in this, it must have been in the other chapter. So we're not going to go back. But what he said, he says, because what will happen if somebody comes and they see me eating? Won't they be empowered to do the same? Do you understand? Now, Paul says, I know there's no other God, but somebody else may come along. Sister Candace may come along and she sees me eat. She says, hey, those are offered to idols. Man, he must be serving those other gods. And if she eats, her conscience is seared where I'm doing good. So then I should deny myself of the liberty that I have in Christ for the sake of somebody else, me being a stumbling block for them. Do you understand that? Sometimes something that is good for me, I should say no to simply because somebody else is watching me. So guess what? My mother, uh, not my mother, uh, hmm. my wife, <laughs> my wife, you know, she just, I, I don't think she does it anymore, but I'll buy me a big bottle of those naked juices and I'll put it in the refrigerator and saints, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to grab my naked juice and I'm going to cook, 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 and I'm going to put it back in there. It's me, my wife and my kids. Now, my brothers and my sisters who are. Uh, come to the house uh, uh, quite often, they say, hey, uh, that's open. Did you drink out of that? <laughs> Sorry, I'm 
So my liberties are held in check because somebody else comes over and they can't do what I do. And so I don't do it not because it's wrong. I can do that. It's my bottle. It's my refrigerator. It's my house. I can drink out the bottle. But I won't because of somebody else. I will deny myself my rights in God for the sake of somebody else's salvation. And so the conscious sake is not Paul's conscience, but it's somebody else's conscience. And so he's not is not even talking about clean and unclean meats It's talking about things that have been offered to idols. And whether or not we could eat food that has been offered to idols, whether that's right or wrong. Paul says it's OK. Eat what's offered to idols. That doesn't matter. See, what was going on in Corinth is when they would go to the markets, they were living in a pagan town. And when they would go to the markets, the people would would, you know, they'd have their their altars and their shrines and whatever the case may be. And they'd bless their food and they'd put it out there. And a Christian would come by and say, man, I can't eat that. You just prayed over that and you dedicated that to Dagon. I can't eat that. And Paul says, man, yeah, you can. Yes, you can. There's no God but God. But be careful. Be careful when you do. Because someone may be watching and they may not know it's all right. They may not have that type of conscience. For, so for their sake, it'd probably be good if you deny it. That's what those verses are saying. Any, does, does that make sense? Anything else, saints? Yes. Yes, that does make sense. But I, I had a comment from before, too. It popped into my mind. It's like, like with the, um, in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and where God was showing us like the things that were good to eat and the things that weren't. And the, the criteria was that it shouldn't have blood. And I've heard, I don't know if it's true, but I've heard that when you drain the blood out of the meat, it just pretty much tastes like rubber. <laughs> Well, and it tastes like nothing. And so even on that basis, if we were doing it the right way, nobody would actually want to eat that. It would probably all be plant based. Two things, two things that are in when we talk about clean and unclean meats. Now we just deal with clean meats. We don't deal with unclean meat. Unclean meats don't matter. Blood, fat, doesn't matter. Don't touch it. But clean meats, God adds the stipulation. Let me pull up this quote. Let me show you why. I want you to hear this. Listen to this. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. I got two. I'll, I'll use these two. All right. I'm going to use these two right here. I want you to read it with me. See that diet thing, man. I tell, you know, I used to say long time ago and I say the same thing today. I said, there are two things that in any Adventist church going to ruffle feathers. Diet and music. You mess with my plate and you mess with me jamming and we got a problem. I, I think that's why many people do not like the prophet. She takes away those simple luxuries of life. But I want you to understand. The first sin was over what? First thing that Christ did when he started his ministry was what? The prophet of the Lord says that if we would have victory over our appetite. We will have moral power to overcome every temptation of Satan. You know what moral power is? I hate to say something that's outside of Christ, but I, I know no better way of explaining it. So I know a Buddhist. I took my vehicle to a Buddhist to get fixed. Found out he was a Buddhist later. Doesn't matter. He was a mechanic. And he said, 
I won't fix your car. I said, eh. he said, because I know what you're getting ready to do with it. And it's going to break again. He said, if, he says, I usually give six months, sometimes a year warranty on my work. He said, but if I fix it and if you drive away, I won't give you any warranty. He said, because it's going to break again. I was towing a fifth wheel RV with a 1500 truck. And he said, your transmission is going to break again. OK, it's too much. That RV is too much for that truck. It's going to break. He said, I'm shooting myself in the foot. Many people would just take your money, he said, but. You know, I'm a Buddhist and uh, it's not right, so I won't fix it. He had moral integrity. He had morals. He said, I won't do this. My training won't let me. He didn't serve Jesus Christ. Moral power to resist every temptation of Christ that coupled with the supernatural element that God wants to abide in our heart. How do I get this thing to show the Control P. No. No. Okay. Windows P. I don't even know what a Windows P is. There we go. Duplicate. All right. Look at this quote. All right. Yeah. Watch this. When those who know the truth take their stand on the side of right principles for time and for eternity, when will they by true be true to the principles of health reform? When will they learn that is dangerous to use flesh meat? I am instructed to say that if ever meat eating were safe, it is not safe now. You know why? You know why? Because they're feeding you anything. That's what I stopped eating meat before I joined the church. OK, I gave up meat before I joined the church. I saw a commentary on the meat industry and I said, this is back in 95. And I said, what? This is what they're feeding me. I said to myself, I said, I'm going to get my favorite meal one more time. Fettuccine Alfredo, lemon butter sauce, some chicken parmesan, big slab of cheesecake and an orange crushed soda. Yes, sir. And I got this with, with the mushrooms and everything on there and I started biting into it and I start. I couldn't even finish it. This is my favorite dish. I was tearing this up on the regular. And I couldn't eat it. I remember taking it and sitting on the floor and gave it to my dog. Couldn't eat it because I know what's in it. Listen to what this next one says. That was 1902. That was 1902. <laughs> All right. Uh. All right, we're going to start at the top. See what it says, Daniel. All right, Daniel would not touch the king's meat. Who of us are eating meat today? Who have thought that they must live upon the flesh of dead animals? We should not do it. We are composed of what we eat. God has given you those things that would make you healthy. Do not put corpses on your tables. Do not, I beg you, eat the flesh of dead animals, for there is enough that you can live upon without that. Now watch this. What does meat eating do? It creates animalism in the human agent. It strengthens the animal propensities, which are already strong enough. You would be better. You would better be strengthening. You would better be strengthening. I don't understand. That doesn't make sense to me. You would better be strengthening the spiritual powers. I see it. It just doesn't make sense to me. God helps us that we may 
by self-denial and self-sacrifice, keep a clear brain and an understanding mind. And then it goes on to talk about some other stuff, but we ain't going to deal with that because we're not talking about my cheesecake and cookies right now. All right. We're talking about meat. All right. So let's just get the rest off the screen. You see how we do? You see? Because right in there is me, all my cookies, cakes and pies, you know? What I have learned to do is, I don't know if some of you are sitting with me at the table today. What I learned to do is push that plate away. That's what I learned to do. You know, in the past, I see you. In the past few months, I've lost roughly about 30 pounds. I'm working on 20 more. Just from eating right, just from eating at regular times, not getting full and drinking my water. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we see it. She says, you know, it, it creates uh, animal propensities. You remember some of you. Uh, uh, hold on. Let me go to you first. You had your hand up. Let me go to you first before I make this comment. We are trying to be like the world. Give us a king like the rest. Yeah. We want to eat like they do. We try to get as close as we can without getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. But okay. we need to follow God, not follow the world. Amen. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. Uh, man of God. Now, let me ask the woman of God. How old, when you were in your 20s, how old was it that young girls were reaching their puberty? How old were they when they began to start getting their menstrual cycle? Probably 12. 12, okay. 14. 12, 13, okay, all right. You know, a lot younger now. You know, I thought you was going to say a little older, but that's good. That's fine. But a lot younger. They're reporting now 9, 10 years old. Want to know why? You know why. Why? Wait. Be because they're giving these animals these growth hormones that's speeding up the growth of our children abnormally. And so the animal propensity. You know, we, was, we, was, we were teaching at the school, and I can't tell you how many times, well, I'll go away from the school. But we, we, we were dealing with young people, and I'll, I'll move away from that. But I can't tell you how many times we have changed the diet of 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 uh, of the of the young people, some of the children and their temperament changed. We just read you are what you eat. So let's get back to this. Let's anything else here. But we got on meat. I, somehow I knew that was going to take us to uh, 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 eating of of meat. But. The meat that was mentioned here was back to the main point that was coming out of that verse is that that verse is not saying we could eat whatever we want to as long as we pray over it. It's saying that there will be people who say you can't eat what God said you could eat. And what we can eat is to be received with thanksgiving. So. Okay. All right. That's that's it. Any 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 questions? Any thoughts? You know, we can go on and on on this on this topic. We could belabor it a little bit more, but but the gist of it is there. You know, we look at these scriptures, and a lot of these scriptures you have to see. You have to go beyond face value of what the scripture is ta is saying. I have to see what are you talking about here? Because I can prove from the Bible if I use one verse, I always use this analogy. I got to get another one. I could prove from the Bible from one verse, not if I go from verse to verse, but if I just take one verse, I could show that a man can have in the New Testament as many wives as he wants. As long as each one of them is a virgin. If you use one verse. 
But if you go from verse to verse to verse to verse and you read contextually, you'll see that's not what the verse is saying. That's not what God is saying. And so we have to read contextually. We have to go other places. We go verse by verse. And. Yeah. And the overwhelming evidence from the past. Is enough to say that the present scripture does not negate everything God has said in times past. That's what we want to do. We get this verse and we say, hey, see, ooh, all of that doesn't matter. I got one verse. How I found the one, the verse where the Bible says, where he told the children of Israel to go get some mixed drinks. It's because somebody walked up to me and said, man, the Bible said I could drink. And he showed me that verse. And I said, man, I could show you 10 verses to that one where the Bible says don't do it. So what, what, who has the more evidence? Give me another verse that just says that. I don't know any other ones. I said, well, then it's, it's not good enough because in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. You need to give me at least three verses to prove that I could drink alcohol. And he knows we can't drink alcohol, but that's just something that we want to do. So when we're looking for it, we're going to find it. Yes, sir. So I was uh, doing some Bible studies with a couple of lesbian ladies over whether or not it was okay to be lesbian. And one said, well, we go to a church. And she said, the verses that talk about homosexuality are not talking about women. They're talking about men. Oh boy. I'm sorry, they're not, talking, they're not talking about women. They're only talking about men. So what we do. And so then I took them to the New Testament and said, for even their women do that, which is against nature. She goes, well, that's not what that means. Hmm. And so, but it's, um, you know, it's, People will find what they're looking for in God's word. God's going to reflect back to them. But if you're looking for what he wants, then he's going to show us. Perfect. You know, so that's, that's just, that's how I found it. It's like I did Bible studies with people who didn't want to keep Sabbath. And it didn't matter what I showed them. Yeah. They, all they could see was Sunday. And so I finally said, and I, I actually was in, and I was broken over it because it was like a group of people. And the Jesuit priest that I was doing the, we were, anyway, it was a big thing. And uh, he won the souls. I won the argument. And I learned from that. You know, I said, Lord, why didn't, why didn't they? He goes, he told me they never wanted to keep Sabbath. So therefore, their minds would not allow them to see any evidence different than what they're doing. Yeah, I had somebody ask me, they called me and they said, homosexuality. They said, show me in the Bible where homosexuality is wrong. Show it to me. Show me where it's wrong. I said, I'm not going to show you. They said, why won't you show me? I said, I, I said, because you know that alcohol drinking is wrong and you still drink alcohol. I said, you know that this is wrong and you still do it. I said, so only thing I'm going to be doing is adding to your list of things that you know wrong and you don't do. I said, you have enough evidence already to know how to shape your life after God would have it. So getting this information is not going to change anything. They said, oh. We're not here to debate. You know, just here to show what we learn from the word of God. So I pray that that was helpful. Yes, sir. Oh, no. You know, all right. No, no, no. So. I pray that that was helpful, saints. Those are just three verses. That's one of the things that I used to do or still do at the church, but used to do with the workers a lot. Because when the workers go out, these are things that you will see when you go out and you start interacting with people in the community and you start trying to uh, 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 convince them that you know the way of salvation. When you want to compel them to give their heart to Christ. And they say, well, I don't need to do that thing that you say the word says I should do. We should be able to answer those questions. We should know what these verses mean and what those challenges we will face. I, those verses, I have faced them. 
There are many more tough verses in the Bible that look like they say something else. But when you go from here to there, you see the common thread of the Bible. And a lot of people ain't going to take the spirit of prophecy. But you read the spirit of prophecy. You learn the principle. And then you find that principle in the word of God. That's a lot what I do. I read the spirit of prophecy and then I say, let me see, can I find that in the Bible? Can I prove that from the Bible? Sure enough, I can. Praise God. Thank you for your word. All right. Saints, I'm going to close unless you want to keep going because I told you this is my hobby. This is fun to me. All right. I'm enjoying myself. Yes, ma'am. I was under the impression we were going to be talking about the COVID thing that started in March, <laughs> but I had to run and get Shanisha. Did I yeah. miss something? Yes. You missed me explaining why we're not going to be doing the COVID okay, thing. I figured. And I'll just say it to you very briefly. The reason why is because I thought I had the file on my computer. I did not. I can't share that without the PowerPoint showing you those laws because I don't know those laws by heart. So <laughs> she wants she wants to know when you're coming back to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Ask uh Shepherd. Shepherd will let us know. Shepherd, when am I coming back? Oh, I'm not, he said. <laughs> well, there you have it, Saints. But uh Shepherd's not in charge. Shepherd's not in charge. <laughs> <laughs> All right, saints, I'm going to close with a word of prayer. If there are no more comments or no more questions, I'm going to close with a word of prayer and turn our service back over to our pastor. All right. All right. Let's bow our heads. Our father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, once again, Lord, again, father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you may magnify it in our heart. Teach us how to study. Teach us how to share with others. In Jesus name, we pray. Help us to be faithful. Amen. Amen. As I sit down, the only way you're going to learn is by teaching. As you teach, you will learn. Thank you, Brother Pastor. I'm so very grateful. Um, I want to give you a gift before you go. Um, and it's something that has helped me. Um, you remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus when he came to visit him by night? What did, Nicodem what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? The first thing he said is, you must be born again. And so, and then Paul, do you remember what Paul said about his experience? Where he said, I die how often? So why are these two things? I'm going to tie these two things for you. Paul also said, forgetting those things which are past, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Why does he say I forget those things? Because listen, here's my point. What did the dead know? They don't know anything. So what God is trying to get you and I to, to, to not live off the experiences that we had, whether good or bad, live for the day. And today I can be victorious. Today, I can be born again. So the moment I surrender my heart, all my problems end. How does that happen? It's a super, look at this. Look, read this on the back of, the, of today's bulletin. It says, when the soul surrenders itself to Christ, a new power takes possession of the new heart. A change is wrought, which man can never accomplish for himself. It is a supernatural work, bringing a supernatural element into human nature. The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes his own fortress, which he holds in a revolted world. And he intends that no authority shall be known in it but his own. A soul thus kept in possession by the heavenly agencies is impregnable to the assault of Satan. So here's my point. This is why I'm giving it to you. You know, in my family, you know, smoking, it's an addiction. I mean, we're born in my family, 
You know, our mom smoked while we were in utero, and she smoked while we were little. We grew up with cigarettes all around us, smoking, vaping, all of that. Drug addiction, drinking. In order to overcome these things, I had to be born again and make a decision to accept the life of Christ. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday. Today, I can be victorious. It doesn't matter if you fail today. You can surrender now, and you can be victorious. And the reason why I'm saying this to you is because it's only possible if you believe it is. The Bible says, if first there be a willing mind. And then you say, well, Lord, I'm struggling even with that. He said, then pray that, that God give you a willing mind. Pray that, you know, oh, well, how's that verse go? It's, uh, he said, uh, Lord, make me willing to be willing, you know. And so when you say, create in me a clean heart, you're saying, Lord, I don't have the power. I feel morally weak, but thou art strong. Whatever the thing is, whatever the experience. And this is why I wanted to give this to you. One of the reasons why I wanted Perch to come, yeah, I get to see my brother. But more than that, I knew God would have something for me that would help me. So that I can sit and hear the word. Teaching is wonderful, but there are times as a man of God, I like to sit down and say, Lord, what do you got for me? I took so many notes. And I want to encourage each and every one of you. Victory is just a surrender away. And if you fail, when you were learning how to walk, I love this analogy. You were learning how to walk and you fell down. Not one of our parents, no matter how wicked, drunk, drug addict, nobody came over and said, and just punted you against the wall because you couldn't learn how to walk. How much more does God in heaven look at you and I when we fail and say, it's okay, come on, I'll take you by the hand and I'll walk with you. And so I want to give you this gift. It's the gift of God's commitment to helping you to walk the walk. And you know what? It's powerful as a child. You know, we, not only did they learn how to walk at the same time, they learned how to talk at the same time. They learn all these things. And the Lord says that we should be like them. So I'm trying to be more like Shepherd. That's right. I'm trying to be more like Shepherd when he's doing what's right. Let's pray. <laughs> all right. Father in heaven, thank you again for bringing our dear brother Pastor all the way, the 3,000 or so miles that he came to spend time with us, to minister to us. And Lord, I pray that you would pour into him and have poured into him according to the gift that he's given us. Thank you for the things that we have learned. And I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen each of us. And I pray, Lord, that each of us would be the Christians you've called us to be. So whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we would do all, even to the glory of God. And we do it, Lord, not by strength, not by might, but by your spirit. So we pray, even in Jesus' name, these things to be so. In Christ's name we pray, Lord. Amen. Thank you again. God bless you. We are coming back on Wednesday prayer meeting at 6 p.m. And then on the 16th is going to be communion. And so, um, so that you can prepare for that. God bless. Have a wonderful weekend or evening. And then uh, we look forward to seeing you again either next Sabbath or on prayer meeting.